So, uh, welcome everyone to another Brains at Bay. So today we'll be talking about alternatives to backpropagation in neural networks. So Brains at Bay is an online machine learning meets neuroscience meetup. And we discuss brain-inspired machine learning algorithms from the perspective of neuroscientists and machine learning researchers. So you always try to have at least one neuroscientist and at least one machine learning research in every session so we can uh, juxtapose different points of view and have interesting discussions in the end. And our goal here is to bring the neuroscience world to the machine learning community. So we had previous meetups on active dendrites, um, predictive processing, had been learning, sparse representations, and several other topics. And if you have uh, feedback and suggestions for next topics or speakers, just uh, leave me a message at, um, you can send me an email at lsos.momento.com or you can leave a message at our message board. So you can find us in the meetup page, just look for Brains at Bay. And uh, Brains at Bay is sponsored by Nomenta and also with the support of UCSC. So uh, I'm really glad that we grew the number of participants over the past year. So we started very small, just at Nomenta was like a local thing last year. And since the pandemics, we moved to this online format and I'm glad that we can reach uh, a lot more people in this format. So right now we have 293 people confirmed for this meetup. And I, uh, Jack was there in one of our first sessions when it wasn't online, we were trying to fit like 40, 50 people in this very small meeting room. It was even kind of funny. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm happy with this new format. So and I, I should say a lot of people watch it on YouTube as well. We get the yeah, we usually yeah. get over a thousand views on YouTube after. So we always heard um, two assumptions: is that uh, the brain doesn't backpropagate, and deep learning only works with backpropagation. And today we try to challenge both of these assumptions and just to generate a discussion. So we start with uh, Professor Rafael Bogach, and let me know if I'm pronouncing your name uh, incorrectly, okay. from University of Oxford. And he's gonna show us that the brain might implement something which is akin to backpropagation. And it will be followed by a talk by Cindy and Jack, uh, Cindy from the University of Amsterdam and Jack from Brain Neuromorphics. And they will show on the machine learning side that deep neural networks can learn without backpropagation or something uh, which approximates backpropagation. And at the end, we have a discussion panel to try and compare and contrast different points of view and also to address the questions. So the talks will be recorded and made available later on YouTube. So I will add the link to the Meetup page. Uh, the slides will also be available if the speakers agree. So sometimes it's confidential or it's uh, unpublished research. So we can make the slides available. And the preferred way to ask questions is through the Q&A feature. You can find it in the Zoom. So we're using the webinar format. There is an option to ask a question and you can also vote an existing one. So the questions you vote are gonna to flow to the top and it's gonna increase the likelihood that we can answer them uh, during the session. So we try to answer some of the questions during the talk. I also encourage the speakers to look for the question there, see if they can reply in the chat itself. But most of the questions, especially the long ones, we try to address in the discussion panel at the end. And uh, if you prefer to ask a question in person, to send me a, a message, a direct message, and I can promote it to panelists. And that's especially at the end of a talk, if we have time at, at the discussion panel so we don't uh, interrupt the talk. So we start with Rafael. Rafael, do you mind if I uh, give a brief introduction? Yes, please do. Okay. So if you wanna share, let me pause share. Wait, okay. So if you wanna try and uh, share your presentation. Uh, can you see this? We can. We can, yeah. So um, Rafael Bogac is a professor at the University of Oxford. His research is in the area of computational neuroscience, seeking to develop mathematical models describing computations in the brain that give rise for mental abilities. He's a prolific researcher with many highly cited publications. And among other themes, he has written extensively about the feasibility of backpropagation in neural networks, which is the talk today. And I had the pleasure of listening to him in other occasions, and I know he's a superb speaker. And it's a pleasure having you here today, Rafael, because whenever you're ready, take it away. 
Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Lucas, for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to uh, participate in this uh, exciting conference and exciting symposium. So uh, I would like to start our discussion of alternative um, to backpropagation by talking about a model for learning in biological neural networks known as uh, predictive coding. But before I uh, describe predictive coding, um, I would like to briefly um, give an overview of um, evidence for backpropagation like learning taking place in the brain and of different approaches of um, um, modeling how backpropagation can be approximated uh, in the brain. Uh, and as one of these approaches is predictive coding, I will focus on it and discuss similarities and differences to um, backpropagation. So the organization of a uh, visual system in the brain shares many similarities with the organization of artificial neural networks. So as the information um, is propagated um, from uh, through the different cortical areas, it reminds how the information is propagated through different layers of artificial neural networks. Um, so this kind of anatomical similarity raises a question whether there is also functional similarity, namely whether different layer also makes similar computations to different cortical areas. So to address this question, um, in a um, number of people performed this really exciting experiments where they presented the same images to humans in the brain scanners and to train artificial neural networks. And then they calculated the index of similarity between patterns of activity in neurons in particular brain area and in neurons in particular layer of artificial neural networks. And now you can see this uh, index of similarity for either early visual areas or late visual areas in the human brain. And you can see that the early visual areas represent information in a similar way as early layers of artificial neural networks, while the uh, late areas, uh, very abstract areas of the visual system have similar representation to the late areas of artificial neural networks. So this is an example of similarity across layers in the information processing, but um, there's also um, one could see that something like backpropagation could also describe uh, information pr processing within brain area. Um, so this is um, a study of my, my colleagues from Oxford who were interested in understanding information processing uh, within the primary visual cortex and in particular um, wanted to know why the neurons in the visual cortex have particular receptive fields when they, where they respond to moving edges. Um, so their hypothesis was that this kind of receptive fields, fields allow the network to predict the next frame. So their hypothesis was that the goal of, this, of the primary visual cortex is essentially to predict the next frame of the image on the basis of the history. So to test this hypothesis, they trained artificial neural network to, uh, on kind of small patches of natural um, movies, and they trained them to predict the next frame from the previous frames. And in this network, um, the, the neurons had indeed receptive fields, which remind that receptive fields of um, biological neurons. So there are clearly some similarities in the way artificial neural networks and um, the brain process information, but there's also a big criticism of uh, artificial neural networks. And it started already with a famous paper by Francis Crick um, many years ago, who pointed many shortcomings and many unrealistic aspects um, of neural networks. And I think that the most uh, significant criticism is the unrealistic learning rule. So in particular, in artificial neural networks, um, weights are modified uh, depending on an error term, which is computed by an external program rather than by network itself. So network doesn't have neuron, artificial neural networks don't have neurons which compute this error term. They're kind of computed by a program which runs the network. While in biological neural networks, uh, the synaptic weight modification can only depend on the activity of presynaptic, postsynaptic neurons, and possibly some um, neuromodulatory signal, uh, which is kind of sent throughout the brain globally. So I think that uh, this is the, the, the kind of the most serious criticism um, and the, like computational bottleneck for uh, artificial neural networks. And several different models try to address 
how this can be overcome. And, and uh, I would just like to present like few of these approaches, and this is by no means an exhaust, exhaustive list. So if I omit your favorite model, I sincerely apologize. So, so the first approach um, is not to compute and propagate errors at all, but to just send a global error signal throughout the network. And such a global error signal could be provided by neural modulators. Um, in one approach, um, um, you, in one family of approaches using um, um, using this, this global error, um, it is assumed that neurons or synapses are stochastic. So they are not deterministic, but they just kind of fluctuate. And then if the error is low, the fluctuation which resulted in this low error are essentially reinforced. So this activity pattern is more likely to produce in the future. And this is a very simple approach and works well for small program, problems, but as you can imagine, it does not scale to larger problems. And another approach which also uses global error uh, signal um, has been proposed by Peter Rosselma and um, Van Ooyen, uh, does not involve stochastic neurons, but instead assumes that the credit to different synapses is assigned by um, back propagating neural activity after a selection was made. So imagine that you are doing a classification task. First, you propagate information feed forward. You select one of the answers, and then the information is propagated back from these neurons. And these synapses on this back propagated path are uh, tacked for modification. And then the sign of the modification depends on the error signal, which is provided later. And this kind of models work well for classification problems, which have one hot output representation. And there's also another um, uh, family of uh, models, um, which actually com um, compute the errors, um, which are so-called energy-based models. And in one common feature of these energy-based models is that the neural activity in these models evolves in time and in, evolves in a way which reduces a particular function, which is known as an energy function, and this evolution is continued until this energy function conver converges to a minimum. And um, remarkably, for this general class of model, th there is a general recipe for weight modification, which um, for which these models um, approximate the propagation has been developed in a beautiful paper by Celia and Benjo. And this is a wide uh, family of models, which include many of, of, of models uh, which have been proposed in the past, and one can show that all these models actually are special cases of this general recipe known as equilibrium propagation. And I guess the, the third talk today will talk of one of such models. And I will also talk about another model from this family, namely the predictive coding. Um, so, um, but before moving to, um, to predictive coding, let me just go very quickly over back propagation just to introduce the notation I will be using throughout the talk. So um, as you know, um, in artificial neural networks are organized in the uh, layers of neurons and I will denote the inputs to these neurons by Y um, indexed um, with the neuron number and the layer. And uh, so each um, input is a weighted sum of activity of neurons from the previous layers. And the neurons, uh, the network is trained to minimize the output error, which I denote by E. And in particular, the weights are modified in the, in the way which modifies this output error. Um, and one can evaluate this derivative and gets an expression um, in which the weight modification is proportional to the product of activity of presynaptic neuron and an error term associated with the postsynaptic neuron. And this error term is uh, for the last layer is equal to the difference between the actual and desired output, while for the last layer is, is basically a weighted sum of errors from the next layer. So these errors are kind of back propagated, that, hence the name um, of the algorithm, but they are not computed by the network itself. So, um, just let me show you an example of how artificial neural network uh, operates. And again, again, this example is shown to just later compare with um, uh, predictive coding networks. So in this cartoon, I will denote neurons by circles. And this little squares show the where the nonlinearity is applied. And the thickness of the lines denotes the weight of the connection. So there are strong connections here and here and here and weak connection everywhere else. 
and the activity is denoted by color. So in this example, I present the following pattern to the input layer. And then activity is propagated. Um, so, th so this neurons, um, this is the output pattern generated by the network. And then we compare this output pattern with the target pattern. We compute the error terms and um, modify the weights. So there are high error terms associated with this neuron because its output is different from the desired output. And also with this neuron, because then this error is propagated through the strong connections where there are low errors associated with this neuron. So the errors, uh, the value of the errors shown by the kind of darkness of the associated triangle. And then the weights which are uh, modified, uh, the weight modification are shown by these green arrows. So the weights which are uh, modified are these two weights and they are increased um, because these are the weights between the active presynaptic neurons and postsynaptic neurons which have high error. And you can see that if you increase these weights, you will be able to propagate information through the network. Okay, so let me now move to the predictive coding networks. <clears throat> so the predictive coding networks were um, originally proposed by um, Rao and Ballard. Um, and I, I should mention at this point that word phrase predictive coding is used in many different contexts by many different people. And I even suspect that um, the second talk today may mention other um, um, category of predictive coding networks. But I will ref use phrase predictive coding to refer to this particular model proposed by Rao and Ballard. Um, and so this is a network uh, which in addition to the value nodes, which correspond to the neurons in artificial neural networks, also uh, includes other group of neurons, which are the error neurons, which are denoted by uh, in red color. And in this network, the connections are bidirectional, which allows the information about the target pattern to propagate through the network. Uh, and in, this, um, in all my cartoons, I will denote by arrows um, the connection, the normal connections, excitatory connections, and uh, the lines with circles will denote inhibitory connections. So this will be connections with the opposite sign. And um, so in this network, uh, for example, the error neurons get both positive and negative connections, which will allow them to calculate uh, the errors. And Ryan Ballard originally proposed this model for unsupervised learning um, in the visual cortex. And then uh, with my former student, James Whittington, we um, noticed that if this model is used for supervised learning rather than unsupervised learning, it has striking similarities to um, artificial neural network and backpropagation. And in particular, it has this uh, um, very nice properties that when you present this model with just an input pattern, it will uh, propagate this um, um, pattern through the network and will compute exactly the same output as an artificial neural network with um, the same um, weights. By contrast, when you present both input and target pattern, uh, then the weights will be updated in a very similar way as in backpropagation algorithm, but employing just local synaptic plasticity. So essentially, this network approximates back propagation in a kind of fully autonomous way with just local plasticity. So let me just um, provide you with more details of how this network works and explain, explain what are the um, kind of computations performed by the error nodes and by this value nodes. So let's start with the error nodes. So the activity of error nodes is equal to the difference between the actual activity of a neuron and prediction based on the previous level, layer. So I should kind of note that in the predictive coding network, there is one error node associated with each value node. So um, this error node basically um, calculates the difference between the activity of its corresponding value node and the prediction of this activity from the previous layer, which I denote by mu. And this prediction is basically the weighted sum of the activity of the neurons in the previous layer. So it basically corresponds to the fee forward input in artificial neural networks. Now, um, as I mentioned, these predictive coding networks uh, follow into this family of energy based models. So they try to minimize an energy function. And this energy function, which I will denote by F, is essentially defined as the sum of all errors in the network squared. So 
it's kind of similar to the error in artificial neural networks, but the difference is that it includes not only the output layer, but encodes, uh, involves errors in the whole network. And the, the dynamics of the value nodes is described by this differential equation, which basically says that the, each value node is modified to reduce this error function over time. And now we can um, calculate the derivative. That, and if one evaluates this derivative, it turns out to be um, equal to a difference between the error um, of the associated node and the error of the nodes in the previous layer um, weighted by the connections. So basically, this um, both the equation for the for the error nodes and the equations for these value nodes can be easily mapped on this network, where um, these neurons essentially calculate um, their activity on the basis of the inputs they receive. Uh, so let me uh, basically show you how this network uh, operates. So let me just show you some again animation made by James Whittington. Uh, for the predictive coding network, which is um, which corresponds to the to the network uh, which I showed um, um, before, to the to the artificial neural network which I showed before. So again, we have strong connections here, here, and here, and weak connections everywhere else. Um, and now um, the initially we present this pattern uh, to the network. So initially, this error neuron receives inhibition from uh, from this uh, from this neuron while there is no uh, activity here so the activity of this error neuron is below the baseline which is represented by blue color and let's let us see what happens when this uh, network is relaxed so you can see that the The activity is propagated through the network by this kind of double inhibitory connection, which essentially results in excitation. And as the activity of, let's say, this neuron increases, then um, the error um, now de decays to zero because this excitation balances this feed forward inhibition. And while all the errors uh, decay to zero, the activities of all, all the other neurons doesn't change because uh, you, you may remember that the that activity of these value nodes is driven by these errors. Um, so you can see that the network produces exactly the same output as artificial neural network. And you can um, see this mathematically that this will arise in this network because when on the input layer is constrained, um, these errors in this network can be fully reduced to zero um, for the following reasons. that the, you, you can recall that the errors are the differences between the actual activity and the predicted activity. Uh, so you can uh, achieve zero error if the actual activity is actually equal to the predicted activity. And, uh, and so I'm just kind of rewriting this equation, expanding this equation. And you can see that um, when the um, actual activity is equal to the predictive activity, you have exactly the same uh, propagation of information as in artificial neural network. Now, when both input and output layers are constrained, errors can no longer decay to zero, but they converge to values which are actually very similar to error terms in backpropagation. So let me just um, now, um, um, in a moment I will show you animation, but let me just also um, say that once the network converges, then the weights are modified again to minimize the, the energy function. But now the energy function includes not just the errors on the last layer, but includes the errors on all layers. So because of this, uh, this gradient has a much simpler form and is simply equal to the product of the presynaptic activity and the error uh, on the postsynaptic side. But since this uh, weights now connect this uh, value nodes to error nodes, this rule simply con corresponds to Hebbian plasticity, which is the product of activity of presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. So the, so the weight modification, which minimizes the energy function, just corresponds to the Hebbian plasticity. So let me now show you how this network operates when we now constrain both the input and output layer. So you can see that now the errors um, no longer converge to zero, but these two errors um, actually are non-zero and they are non-zero because there's kind of mismatch between the feedback and feed forward input. And then when the weights are modified, 
Uh, again, we modify uh, weights between the active presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons, which is this weight and this weight. So now if you compare the weight modification between backpropagation and predictive coding network, you can see that the, the same weights are most modified. And this happens because the activity of these error nodes in a in predictive coding network is very similar to the um, value of these error terms in backpropagation. And one can also show this analytically um, why um, the errors have take the similar uh, value. So let us consider first the errors in the output layer. So the errors in the output layer um, get um, compute the difference between the activity on the output layer, which is set to the target pattern, and prediction of the previous layer. So this is the, the, the equation. And you can see that this is fully analogous to the one in the backpropagation algorithm. It's not exactly the same because while the activity is pro pro um, propagated through predictive coding networks, the activity of hidden nodes can change, but it's very similar. Now, remarkably, uh, the relationship between the errors in one layer and the layer uh, before in predictive coding network is exactly the same as in artificial neural networks. So this relationship is given here, and it's exactly the same as in artificial neural networks for analogous kind of terms. So, and you can see that this um, relationship will uh, hold just looking by the equation that describing the evolution of this value nodes in predictive coding networks, which I'm rewriting here. So this is a differential equation. So this denotes derivative over time. And then in the equilibrium, once the network converges by definition, um, this derivative over time is equal to zero. So if we set the left-hand side to zero, we move this term to the right-hand side, we get this relationship, which is exactly the same as in artificial neural network. So given the similarity um, in computation, you can expect the same performance. And um, James Whittington simulated artificial neural networks and predictive coding networks in exactly the same setting on MNES data set. And as you can see, and uh, they have exactly the same performance. So, so far I try to argue that predictive coding networks can approximate um, backpropagation. Um, but you know, the question remains, are they doing backpropagation exactly or not? And you can see that there are differences between backpropagation and predictive coding networks. Um, so, um, for example, if you compare the weight modification, you can see that in predictive coding network, also this weight is modified, while in artificial neural network, this weight is not modified. And it happens in predictive coding network is now is, uh, that because the um, while the target is provided, the information is propagated by this network, it changes the activity of hidden nodes. And um, during this propagation, this hidden node changed its activity and now, um, um, so the weight modification proportional to the presynaptic and postsynaptic activity will increase this connection, while here, this neuron was inactive. So this weight is not increased. And you can see that uh, changing this weight also makes sense because um, basically uh, it allows to propagate the information through this branch. So although the weight modification is different, it's also the weight modification which also makes sense in the network. Um, so one could modify predictive coding model to perform backpropagation exactly. And it was um, demonstrated uh, in a, um, this year NeurIPS paper by my student, Yuhang Song, um, who showed that you can modify um, predictive coding networks uh, in a way that um, weights are modified before the neural activity changes, and then these networks will indeed perform backpropagation exactly. But this is a very unusual way of uh, using predictive coding networks. And maybe rather more interesting to compare the pattern of errors from the two algorithms and neural activity while humans learn new classification tasks. So, so you know, it could be really interesting an ex experiment to uh, basically perform error, to compare errors in different models, in predictive coding models in artificial neural networks, um, and look for particular experimental paradigms where these two models make different predictions on errors 
and then compare this with with neural activity to see if if indeed um, um, brain networks do something similar to backpropagation or something more similar to predictive coding. Also, um, another thing um, to mention is that predictive coding originally assumed a particular mapping of the network on cortical areas. So when Ra and Ballard pro um, developed predictive coding model, in their original study, they were presenting the sensory input, so the image, to this layer of the network. So um, the predictive coding networks were predicting sensory input. They were not predicting the class of the image, as I was showing in my, our MNEST example, but instead they were predicting the image. And because the, these networks can uh, um, predict the image, they, they were able to perform unsupervised learning. So now, um, if you believe Ra and Ballard that this is indeed the way uh, the networks in the brain are organized, then the networks are really trying to predict the visual image and they may perform classification not by trying to kind of guess the label, predict the label, but by looking for the best explanation for the sensory input. So trying to think what label would allow me to best predict this sensory input. And again, it would be really interesting to compare the errors um, coming from predicting of sensory input, predicting the image from the label um, um, and the errors uh, from stand standard propagation and compare them with the brain activity. Also, the network structures in the brain will have a you know, different, even over, uh, high level structure than artificial neural networks. So for example, um, so this is my son, Ben, and, and at certain stage, he was learning to uh, pronounce letters. So uh, you know, in this exercise, he would point, see a letter, he would try to uh, make a, a sound, and then daddy would provide the correct label, and somehow he would modify the synapses in his brain. So, so the way this task is solved in the brain is that probably the visual input is provided to one sensory modality and the label is actually provided to another sensory modality. It's not provided to the top layer in the network, but it's essentially propagated um, um, through, this whole, uh, through this whole layer. Um, I may also mention very briefly that uh, the predictive coding model, um, since we kind of um, developed, um, showed that it can approximate backpropagation, it has been um, extended by other people. And in particular, um, work of Baron Milich and his colleague demonstrated it can be generalized to different architectures, convolutional networks, recurrent networks for temporal prediction, um, and various other things. Uh, and uh, it certain constraints on its architecture, like existence of the special one-to-one -one connections can be relaxed and network can still retain good performance. Um, so in summary, um, in this talk, I try to argue that the aerobic propagation algorithm can be approximated in predictive coding networks, um, but the predictive coding networks um, do not perform backpropagation exactly um, so um, the, this predictive coding networks, and in fact, many other energy-based models may be an alternative to um, backpropagation, which can be used by biological uh, systems. So I would just wanted to acknowledge that um, much of the work was, which I presented was done by a, my former student, uh, James Whittington, and the current student, Yuhang Song. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafa. Yeah, that was, that was you. awesome. Um, there are some questions in the Q&A. If you can uh, look at them later, maybe you can answer in the chat itself, or we can just um, delay them to the discussion panel. Uh, I do have a quick question. I think two things jump to mind in this model is we have one error node associated to each neuron, and we have uh, symmetric weights between the, the forward and the feed forward and the feedback connections. So are those, um, do you consider those viable in the brain? And they, they seem to be uh, like a stretch. Yes, so, so this is a most common criticism of predictive coding networks. And I think that one, in one of my uh, latest slides, I was mentioning that uh, Baron Millage recently has a, a published a preprint where he demonstrated that you can relax these assumptions. So um, for example, you can relax this one-to-one -one connections by all-to-all -all connections, and you also, um, can initialize the weights 
to non-equal values. Um, so you kind of avoid symmetric weights and the network still works and retain performance. So this is one way um, to address this, um, this, um, um, this criticism. Another way of addressing the criticism of this one-to-one -one connections between the value neurons and error neurons is that the, um, you know, um, there's another very beautiful model uh, proposed by um, Sacramento and colleagues um, where the errors are represented in dendrites. And it turns out that you can essentially rewrite their model and in equivalent form, um, and you get something which looks like predictive coding. So essentially you can rewrite equations of, pre uh, of predicting coding in an equivalent form and then map them on a slightly different architecture in which the error is actually not rep represented in a separate neuron, but in the dendrite of the neuron. And then this model is uh, very, very similar to the model by Sacramento et al. So, so there are two possible answers to the, um, you know, to the criticism of, of this one-to-one -one connections. Um, is either you can uh, absorb the errors into dendrites or you can essentially, this has been solved by Baron Millet, you can just write another form of this, you can just essentially come up with another energy function where, which, which gives you another architecture uh, which um, still uh, has similar performance. All right. Thanks. Uh, Subtai, you, you said you had a few questions. Um, yeah, I, I, that was really wonderful. Um, it always felt intuitively that the delta signal in backpropagation is encoding some type of prediction error between how these neurons are supposed to do and uh, perform. And so it's really nice to see that kind of formalized uh, in this way. I guess I have lots of questions, but maybe I'll ask a little bit about uh, kind of the timing of everything. So as I understand it, this network has to settle. Um, in order to uh, compute the errors properly. Whereas in backprop, you know, you do everything in one feed forward pass and you get the error. So what I'm wondering is, can this network run faster? Can it run sort of almost in an asynchronous mode where, you know, inputs are just streaming in and I'm uh, conscious of the kind of the picture you showed of the, the visual hierarchy and the auditory hierarchy and the, you know, the timings of all that would be different. You know, how do you think about kind of the just generically the timing of this and working in kind of a streaming, uh, you know, sensory kind of uh, uh, framework? Uh, yeah, so, so this is uh, another very good question. So in the original um, predictive coding model, uh, the weights have to first converge before um, you modify the weights. So um, first, um, James Whittington, um, in his simulation, he observed that this, you can actually stop this relaxation process very quickly. So you don't mm -hmm. have to wait for the network to converge. You can just stop the simulations uh, after just a small number of steps and then um, you use the values to, to update the networks. Um, so um, this is uh, something- That's what I was wondering, yeah. yeah. Demonstrated. And then, um, Yuhang Song is currently analyzing uh, whether you know you can um, run things in parallel and and uh, you, if, if you can speed it up even more and what kind of computational properties you, you get from this. So so uh, yeah. So he's kind of working uh, uh, on this at the moment. Yeah, that would be great. That's something backprop cannot do, right? That the uh, you know backprop has this very kind of rigid backward and and mm -hmm. feed forward flows, and it'd be great if this could be run in some sort of an asynchronous uh, manner. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I have more questions, but I could leave them to the end. <laughs> yeah, uh, time. So thanks a lot again, Rafal. It was a great talk. Um, so let's move on to Cindy. Cindy, you want to share your screen? Uh, yeah, let me set it up. So um, how do I pronounce your name? Is it Cindy Lowe? Uh, Louvre. Louvre. Oh, that's going to be hard. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> So uh, Cindy uh, Leuven is a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam, supervised by Professor Max Welling, where she researches on self-supervised representation learning, focused on mutual information maximization approaches and on structured representations. Her publications cover themes in neuroscience and machine learning. And she's the first author of the paper, putting an end to end, to end <laughs> gradient isolated learning of representations which received an outstanding New Directions paper award last year in New Groups. And that's a great paper name, by the way. Uh, uh, 
Welcome, Cindy. We've been uh, following up your work with uh, great interest, and we're really happy you can be here today to present it to us. Yeah, uh, thanks for that great introduction. I'm very happy to be here. I think this is like a, a great forum for a topic that I, I find very interesting. Um, and yeah, thanks, Rafa, also for that great um, talk. Um, I actually find it very interesting because predictive coding was the very initial um, inspiration for me to go um, into this direction of work. Um, so yeah, I find it very exciting to now actually give a talk following up on that. Um, so yeah, um, I would actually like to present the findings that we've uh, presented in this paper with you today uh, with the title, Putting an End to End to End, Gradient Isolated Learning of Representations. And this was a collaboration between Bastian Fehling, Peter, Peter O'Connor, and myself. Uh, so during this presentation, I would like to show you that we can train a neural network without end-to-end -end backpropagation and achieve competitive performance. Uh, but, but, but before I get into the method with which we achieve this, uh, let's answer some basic questions first. And that is what we actually mean with end-to-end -end backpropagation and why we would want to train a neural network without it in the first place. So first of all, let's have a look at end-to-end -end backpropagation, uh, what it does and why it is so important for deep learning. Uh, Rafal already gave an overview of it, um, but I just want to reiterate it uh, just to, um, to build up the argument that I have uh, in my presentation. Uh, so nowadays, basically all of neural networks that you see are trained with end-to-end -end backpropagation. So if you open any random paper with a new method, you can be pretty certain that the neural network within that paper is going to be trained with end-to-end -end backpropagation. And it is indeed a very useful uh, method to train your neural network because it provides a mathematically grounded way for calculating the and applying the weight changes that are necessary to produce a better output for a given input. So if you consider the uh, example on the left, we would have a network um, which receives an image of a cat as an input. And this input would be forward propagated through a number of layers, um, which apply a nonlinear transformation to this input uh, to then finally generate a final output, which for example, could be the label dog. And this is obviously wrong. So we would like to train our neural network to do better. And to do this, we compare the output to a target value, which in this case would be the label cat in order to calculate the loss. And then this is the part where end-to-end -end backpropagation comes into play because um, it is used to backpropagate the gradients that result from this global loss through the entire architecture um, to use uh, those gradients to update the weights in all of the layers in the neural network. And as a result, the network will produce an output that is closer to the desired target the next time that it encounters this input. And eventually when we keep doing this long enough, uh, the network should learn to correctly classify cats and dogs. And now, if this method is so successful, uh, why would we want to train a neural network without it? Um, well, one big inspiration for me, and I guess that's the one that's also mo the most relevant today for us here, is the biological inspiration. Um, and that it is generally uh, accepted that end-to-end uh, -end backpropagation is biologically implausible um, because it is uh, at at least I think highly unlikely uh, that the brain uses end-to-end -end backpropagation to learn and updates its synapse strengths. And I think it's really um, valuable to take lessons from the brain because at the moment, machine learning does not perform as well as our brains do in many domains. Um, so taking lessons from how the brain works might actually help us enhance the capabilities of algorithms. And our brains are extremely efficient learning machines, for example. So we do not need to see a thousand labeled images of dogs before we understand what dogs are. And it is very easy for us to connect new information to concepts that we're already familiar with. And one possible explanation for this efficiency that we see in the brain is that synapses are adjusted predominantly based on local information. Um, and that is based on the information from the immediate neighboring neurons. So they do not have to wait for a global signal to update their synapse strengths. Um, and thus they can train highly asynchronously and in parallel. And I would even argue that most of the time we don't have a global loss sitting somewhere in our brain because we don't get told what is the correct output for any input that we receive. But actually, um, yeah, our brain has to kind of make use of all the input data that we get without having an associated label with it all the time. But besides this biological implausibility, there are also a number of computational issues connected to end-to-end -end backpropagation, 
uh, that we would like to overcome with our method. Uh, one big computational issue is of end-to-end -end backpropagation is the substantial memory overhead that it creates in its typical implementation. Because when we train a neural network with end-to-end -end backpropagation, we need to store the entire computational graph, so everything that's including the weights, the activations, and gradients in the GPU memory. And this can prevent us from training very deep neural networks on high dimensional inputs because GPU memory is generally quite restricted. And this problem with the memory overhead uh, um, is that there's also no easy way to avoid it because it's not possible to train layers separately when we do end-to-end -end backpropagation because end-to-end -end backpropagation creates a strong dependency between the layers. So in the forward pass, each layer needs to wait for the activations from its predecessor to do any calculations on it. And in the backward paths, each layer needs to wait for the gradients from its successor to do its weight update. And this so-called forward and backward locking prevents us from separating the training of individual subparts of the network. And thus, it's, there's no easy way to uh, overcome the memory overhead. Um, at the, and at the same time, end-to-end -end backpropagation prevents us from parallelizing the training of neural network of, of the layers in a neural network. So inspired by this local learning that we find in the brain and also striving to overcome the computation issues of end-to-end -end backpropagation, we developed a new learning algorithm, which we call Greedy Infomax. And in Greedy Infomax, we remove end-to-end -end backpropagation. Uh, to accomplish this, we first divide the network into a stack of modules. And then we train each module using a separate local loss. And then we enforce each module to greedily optimize their own objective by blocking the flow of gradients between modules. And for this greedy training of each module, Greedy Infomax makes use of a self-supervised loss function. Um, thus, we do not only remove the reliance on end-to-end -end backpropagation, but also the reliance on the label data set for the training of our model. And with our proposed method, Greedy Infomax, we show that we can train a neural network without end-to-end -end backpropagation and achieve competitive performance. Uh, let's have a look now at how Greedy Infomax does this in a bit more detail. So with Greedy Infomax, we can take any conventional neural network architecture, and then we remove end-to-end -end backpropagation and optimize modules greedily instead. In order to do so, we do not employ a global loss, but use a separate local loss for the training of each module. And one point to note here is that with Greedy Infomax, we do not necessarily split the architecture at the layer level, um, but instead a module could represent a single layer, a residual block within a residual network, or any subpart that we divide the neural network architecture into. And then we block the flow of gradients in between modules. And this enforces that each module has to greedily optimize their own objective. Or in other words, modules do not receive any gradients from other modules, but only optimize their own local loss. But this also raises the questions, question how we can make sure that the modules still provide meaningful inputs to one another, even though they do not share any gradients. Because um, if they do not share any gradients, how do we ensure that the top module, for example, receives inputs that it can make use of if it cannot um, communicate it, its needs in, forms of, in the form of gradients to its predecessor, predecessors. And to solve this problem, uh, we make use of a specific self-supervised loss function. And to understand the idea behind the self-supervised loss, imagine we are given a short speech sample. When we consider a small patch from the sample, it shares a lot of information with neighboring patches. So for example, after hearing the word cats, we can expect to continue hearing the voice of the same speaker. You can expect that her underlying emotion stays somewhat consistent. And on a shorter time scale, also words and phonemes provide uh, you predi with predictive information. So for example, after hearing the word, the, after hearing all, you can expect the second half of the word sum to follow. And all this shared information between temporally nearby patches, speaker identity, emotions, words, could potentially be very helpful if we can extract that with a neural network. And thus, our goal is to take such a temporal sequence as an input uh, and to train a neural network on it such that it learns to preserve this information that is shared between temporally nearby patches. And for this, we use the Info NCE objective as developed by Van der Nord and colleagues. And essentially, what this objective does, it 
is that it takes uh, pairs of temporally nearby patches and contrasts them against random pairs. And through this contrasting, it enforces that the model has to preserve the information that is shared between pairs of temporally nearby patches. Mathematically speaking, uh, this means that the info NCE objective maximizes the mutual information between temporally nearby representations, or in other words, the mutual information between the representations created by module M for the time steps T and T plus K. And this in turn also maximizes the mutual information between the temporally nearby input and output of each module. That is the input at time step T plus K and the output at time step T. And this provides us with an intuitive explanation as to why greedy InfoMax works, even though the modules do not share any gradients with one another. By maximizing the mutual information between temporally nearby input and output of each module, we enforce each module to keep as much information about its inputs as possible, while preventing it from simply copying its inputs. And thus, the Info NCE objective pushes each module to create useful inputs for its successor. Now going back to our final greedy InfoMax model, we have to add one last thing, and that is an evaluation method for our self-supervised representation learning algorithm. Uh, so what we do for this is that we first train all of our modules greedily with the Info NCE objective, we freeze all of the weights and extract the created representations. And then we train a linear classifier on top of these representations, and the accuracy that this linear classifier achieves provides us with a proxy for the quality and generalizability of the representations that we create with greedy InfoMax. And this is the architecture that led us to our overall statement that we can train a neural network without end-to-end -end backpropagation and achieve competitive performance. Now let's have a look at our experiments that show that greedy InfoMax is indeed competitive. Um, first, we apply greedy InfoMax to the vision domain. And in order to be able to apply the info NCE objective on static images, uh, we have to enforce a temporal order on them. And we do that by extracting patches and enforcing a top-down order. Uh, and then our network learns to preserve the information that is shared between temporally, uh, between near neighboring patches. Um, so I, in this case, that um, it would learn to extract the cat in the image. And we do this on the SDL10 data set. Uh, we compare a couple of methods on this data set, which all share the same architecture, but they're using different training algorithms. But the most important comparison that we want to make here is the one between CPC and our uh, pro proposed greedy InfoMax method. And the reason for this is that CPC uses the same objective, the Info NCE objective, but employs it globally and with end-to-end -end backpropagation. And in contrast to this, greedy InfoMax applies the Info NCE objective locally and without end-to-end -end backpropagation. And when we measure the downstream classification performance on the SDL10 images, we see that greedy InfoMax actually manages to outperform its end-to-end -end counterpart CPC here. And greedy, Infoman greedy InfoMax even manages to outperform comparable state-of-the-art methods on this data set. So here we compare against deep, the deep InfoMax model, which works very similarly to CPC because it maximizes the mutual information between different patches of a given image, but it is using end-to-end -end backpropagation. And Bradsim uses a greedy layer-wise training that is similar to greedy InfoMax, but it makes use of a supervised loss for its training. Something exciting that we found when visually evaluating our results is that the modules in our hierarchy learn to iteratively increase the level of abstraction in their representations, as we can see in these images. So in highlighted in red, you can see ima pa image patches that four neurons, uh, yeah, you can see image patches that one neuron is uh, most sensitive to, always for one neuron for, with four examples. Um, and then in the top, you can see that for the neurons in the first module, so in the lowest level of our neural network. And from these patches, it becomes quite clear that these neurons are most sensitive to edges of specific orientations. So the fourth neuron, for example, seems to prefer edges of this angle. Um, neurons on the final module, on the other hand, that you can see examples of in the bottom, seem to prefer much more abstract features. So for example, the first neuron on the left seems to prefer the text on zeppelins, 
irrespective of their coloring. And this increase in the level of abstraction is a behavior that's commonly observed in end-to-end -end optimized architectures. And we find it very exciting that we observe uh, the same effect in our modules, even though they are optimized greedily and without end-to-end -end backpropagation. After the vision experiments, we have also conducted experiments in the audio domain. And here we use speech samples from the Libre speech data set. And again, we compare greedy Infomax to a number of methods that share the same architecture, but use different training methods. And again, we are most interested in the comparison between greedy Infomax and its end-to-end -end trained counterpart CPC. Uh, the first task that we evaluate our models on is the task of speaker classification. And here we can see that greedy Infomax achieves a very similar performance to CPC. And this is despite the fact that we train every single layer in our architecture greedily with a local loss and without gradients flowing in between the layers. The second task that we test our models on is phone classification. And phones are distinct speech sounds that make up words. And thus this task requires features that can discriminate content while being invariant to the speaker identity that we tested to before. And here we see that greedy Infomax is slightly outperformed by CPC. However, there is an even bigger performance gap between CPC and the supervised model. And van der Noort showed uh, that this gap can actually be closed by extending the linear classifier with a hidden layer, which suggests that the extracted features of both CPC and greedy Infomax might not be immediately linearly separable, but that the performance can be improved quite easily. Now, what I would like to show you here is uh, how the representations evolve throughout the model. And for this, we trained a linear classifier on top of each greedily trained layer of the greedy Infomax architecture. And on the y-axis, we plot the error rate for the speaker classification task. And when we plot the performance of the intermediate layers of the greedy Infomax model, we can see very nicely that each module improves over its predecessor. And this is very interesting because it shows us that each module provides inputs to its successor that the successor can make use of in order to create better representations. And this works even though the successor cannot communicate its needs with its predecessors in the form of gradients or anything else. Uh, when we compare the performance of the intermediate layers um, between the greedy Infomax and uh, the end-to-end -end CPC approach, uh, we find that they actually have a very similar performance uh, throughout the entire architecture. And that is even though CPC employs only one global objective at the final uh, sixth layer, to update all of the layers coherently, it shows a very similar performance to greedy Infomax, not only on this final layer, but also in all of the intermediate layers. Uh, Cindy, uh, sorry to interrupt, but is this error rate from um, the last layer, from the cross entropy at the last layer of the, the linear classifier to the actual target? Or is that the error rate from the info NC loss? Uh, that's the error rate for classifying the speaker identity. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so we see with CPC and greedy Infomax that they perform very similar throughout the entire architecture. And this is in stark contrast to what we observe when we try the same thing with a supervised cross entropy loss. So here the performance of the intermediate layers differs very strongly depending on whether we apply this cross entropy loss greedily to each layer as we do with greedy Infomax or globally at the final layer. And this suggests that the info NCE objective is especially suited for the greedy training with greedy Infomax. So now we've seen that we can train a neural network without end-to-end -end backpropagation and achieve competitive performance. But does this actually alleviate the computational issues that I've started this presentation with? And does it also improve uh, the biological, um, biological implausibility of end-to-end -end backpropagation? Uh, so first of all, um, greedy Infomax can indeed alleviate the computational issues of end-to-end -end backpropagation um, that I've described in the beginning of this presentation, because it allows us to reduce the memory, GPU memory costs substantially. So for all the results that I've presented until now, we've trained all modules of greedy Infomax together and in sync. And in this training mode, our memory footprint is unsurprisingly in the same ballpark for all of the end-to-end -end optimized models. But now greedy Infomax allows us to train each module entirely separately and one after another, 
And by doing this, and after dividing our architecture into three modules, we can actually decrease our GPU memory consumption by almost two thirds. And due to this reduction in the GPU memory costs, Greedy InfoMax could enable us to train much deeper neural networks on higher dimensional inputs. And on top of this, Greedy InfoMax also enables us to distribute the training of individual subparts of a neural network across separate devices, and thus to massively parallelize the training of these subparts. So imagine you have this network on the, uh, on the left, and you would like to distribute its training across three devices. What you would usually do is you would copy the entire architecture over to each device. You would run the entire forward and backward pass on each of the devices, aggregate the results, and then um, adjust the weights. But if this is not possible because of memory restrictions of your GPU, because, for example, you might not be able to fit your entire network on a single GPU, uh, Greedy InfoMax now allows you to um, use an alternative approach to distribute your training across devices. And that is to simply place and train each of the modules on a separate device. And that is possible because the modules only use the gradients of their own local objectives for their weight updates, and they are thus independent in this regard. Now, they still depend on receiving inputs from the predecessors, but this problem can be mitigated quite easily since the modules do not depend on receiving the most recent input for their training. And thus, we can reduce the amount of communica communication needed between devices substantially simply by reducing the frequency at which modules receive new inputs. So for example, we can simply save our each module's output every 10 epochs or so, and um, only then update the input for the net, net next module to train on. Uh, and thus, Greedy InfoMax allows us to train modules separately and enable a more memory efficient, asynchronous, and distributed training. Now, what about the biological plausibility of Greedy InfoMax? Now, of course, there are still uh, some caveats. So for example, Greedy InfoMax relies on negative samples. Uh, so in the Info NCAE objective, um, we need to have random samples from all of our possible inputs um, to contrast against. And I would call it an open question whether the brain could actually implement such a sampling strategy. Um, but nonetheless, Greedy InfoMax does improve over previous methods in terms of biological plausibility. Um, and I think the biggest contribution in this regard is that Greedy InfoMax shows that it is indeed possible to train a neural network without having a global objective and still can, that the neural network can still achieve competitive performance. And additionally, um, and another benefit of Greedy InfoMax, of course, is that it's unsupervised um, and that it doesn't rely on a labeled data set um, to do its training. So overall, we saw that we can train a neural network without end-to-end -end backpropagation and achieve competitive performance. So Greedy InfoMax divides a neural network into a stack of modules and greedily optimizes each module. By enforcing modules to preserve the information of the inputs, we enable the stack of modules to create useful features without using end-to-end -end backpropagation. And thus we demonstrate that deep neural networks do not necessarily need to be trained to end with end-to-end -end backpropagation of a supervised loss in order to learn useful features for perceptual tasks. And at the same time, Greedy InfoMax can circumvent the computation issues connected to end-to-end -end backpropagation and thus enables a more memory efficient asynchronous and distributed training. Now, putting an end to end, <laughs> putting an end to this presentation, uh, I have one announcement to make. Uh, so I'm organizing, co-organizing a workshop at NeurIPS this year that brings together people um, that are interested in alternatives to backpropagation. Uh, and since you're all here attending a meetup uh, uh, about exactly that topic, um, I would assume that this might be very interesting for you as well. Uh, so I invite you to join our workshop and uh, here's the link um, for more information on that. And with this, uh, I would like to thank everyone very much for their attention. Um, I'm happy to hear questions and I'm looking forward to our debate later on. A lot, Cindy. That was, that was great. You explained super well. Um, I just want to take a question from the audience and also a question I had. So I know um, the data set you showed that's the L10 is a data set of self-supervised learning where you only have labels for a few samples and you have a lot of samples which are unlabeled. Uh, have you tried extending this to other data sets which are fully labeled like ImageNet? And, and in that case, does 
the grid info max uh, still helps with fully labeled data sets. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't have the computational resources uh, to run it on ImageNet. Uh, so that's uh, unfortunately too, too big. And SDL 10 is um, nice in the regard that the um, individual images are relatively large still compared to, for example, MNIST, which I think is important for CPC to work um, because the uh, individual patches um, are still, still um, big enough to actually um, contain any useful information to learn on. Mm -hmm. But uh, is, does your intuition say, let's say Cypher 10, would, would that mm -hmm. uh, method still be uh, extendable to fully supervised data set? Can we still uh, get something from using the info in NCLS and learning better representation? I think so, yeah. Um, so STL 10, um, I think the only comparison that is like in that regard, not entirely fair is the ones to the, the, the supervised methods because they can only make um, use of part of the data set to train on. Um, but even the comparison to CPC, which is uh, also trained on the unlabeled parts, um, you see that the performance there is essentially the same with Greedy InfoMax. Um, so it's not that only Greedy InfoMax is making um, use of this unlabeled part of the data set. Um, yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, I have a quick, real quick question, maybe. Um, uh, so first of all, great really great talk. And I love the fact that you started out saying that backprop is not the be all and end all, that the brain actually works really well. And we should try to learn from it. And you you actually showed some examples of that all the way to scaling and stuff. So I, I really like that you made that that point. Um, you know, one sort of very high level question I have is, uh, you know, people have tried for a long time to create kind of unsupervised stacked representations. And typically they never work nearly as well as, you know, purely uh, backpropped uh, supervised uh, solutions. And you touched on this a little bit, but what, what do you think is that, what are some of the key intuitions? Why does this particular loss function work well? Or why, you know, what, what, what is the, can you give us some sense of some intuition as to why mm -hmm. this works so well, this particular? Um, yeah, that's uh, actually a very interesting question. I find for myself that I'm like still trying to find out more about. Um, at the moment I have, two main hypotheses. So the, the first one I basically already presented during the talk is uh, that the info NCE objective optimizes the mutual information between the input and the output of each module. And thus there is some incentive for each module to preserve the information of its inputs, um, which should make sure to some extent that no information is getting lost and the um, succeeding modules still have something to work on. Yeah, but I could argue like auto encoders kind of do the same thing. All right. Uh, if you mm -hmm. if you stack auto encoders, you you know you you achieved you know exactly what you said as well. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, actually, yeah. Also, a different problem um, with this argument is that like there's already papers that show that this connection between the info NCO objective and the mutual information is not actually as strong um, mm -hmm. um, as previously believed. Uh, so the second hypothesis I have at the moment is that it might have something to do with clustering. Um, because essentially there's, um, so in, in my approach, I use uh, contrastive learning, which people have made connections to that it um, learn, uh, learns clustered representations. So essentially the positive samples get clustered together and the negative samples get pushed uh, further apart in the feature space. Um, and then the, the second approach that I also showed in the results earlier, the Pretzim paper, um, that uses a supervised loss um, to do um, a training without end-to-end -end backpropagation. Um, and they have kind of two uh, supervised losses and one of them explicitly enforces a clustering of their latent space as well. So there mm. seems to be some connection between these two methods um, that both of them um, enforce a certain clustering in the latent space. Um, so that's currently my, my um, winning hypothesis, but very yeah. much still an open one. Yeah, thank you. That's great. That's really interesting. Can I make a, a comment slash question? Have you um, have you looked into the information bottleneck theory? Um, I think this would actually be a perfect candidate for getting a little bit more rigorous with that. Um, yeah, but actually the information bottleneck theory is kind of contradictive to this, right? Because um, that one says that they minimize the mutual information between the input and the output but you maximize the mutual information between the output and the label. Um, and 
uh, we don't have a label in the first case, and we're also maximizing the mutual information between input and output. Um, so how so I was thinking, kind of... how I was thinking of it is, is there, you're trying to preserve as much information between from one layer to the next, mm -hmm. um, and that corresponds to the maximization of the information, and then all the other information is just forgotten. Um, so I don't, I don't honestly see how it's sort of contradictory, um, but maybe I haven't thought about it enough. Yeah, it's just, um, well, information bottleneck always makes um, the assumption that you have labels and that the mutual information between those labels and the output is maximized. Whereas here we don't have labels. Uh, so we have to maximize the mutual information between our output and the input instead. Okay. Um, any other questions? In the, we, so we have a lot of questions in the chat. So Cindy, if you can uh, take a quick look at the questions there. If you, you want, you can answer there. We can uh, answer then in the discussion panel later. Yeah, I'll do that. So um, moving on to the next speaker, Jack, you wanna share a presentation? Sure, give me one sec. So just a quick uh, introduction. So Jack Kendall is the co-founder and CTO of Brain Neuromorphics. He's an engineer working to bridge the fields of neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and nanomaterials to create new computing architectures modeled after the brain. And I, I love this description I got from your LinkedIn. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for, for inviting me here. I think this is. Oh, no, no, I'm <laughs> just uh, oh, sure. one more. Wait, so. It, oh, sure. Just wanted to acknowledge we're here in our one of our first edition when we discussed parsing neural networks, and that was that was awesome. And Jack is a brilliant engineer, and I think Rain is one of the most exciting startups in the neuromorphic hardware space. And it's a proposed architecture that could deliver significant breakthroughs in machine learning efficiency and scaling. So we are really excited to what comes next, uh, and we are glad to have you back. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I think this is. Um, a really exciting topic. I think it, this is probably the most important open problem right now, in my opinion, at least uh, in neuroscience and machine learning. So very excited that people are, you know, really focusing on this and especially the two previous speakers. I mean, really, really fascinating work. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, an algorithm that was invented by Yashua Bengio and Benjamin Sellier uh, that Rafal mentioned earlier, actually called equilibrium propagation. And equilibrium propagation is an algorithm for energy-based models. Uh, and here we're, we're basically going to apply it to analog circuits and show how you can use equilibrium propagation to train fully analog circuits end-to-end. Uh, -end. Yeah, I'm not sure how I can move this. There we go. Okay. So first I want to mention a bit about uh, my collaborators on this project. So I have Kalpana and Ross, who are my colleagues at RAIN. And then also Yashua Bengio and Benjamin Sillier from Mila. So I'll start off by giving background on backpropagation. The previous talks, I think, introed uh, backprop pretty well, so I'll keep this short. Backpropagation is the main workhorse of deep learning. It's incredibly simple, um, yet very, very flexible and very powerful. And I think its, it's main sort of appeal is its simplicity. Um, now, the issue is that it's fundamentally non-local. The delta term, which you, which you look at in the update, um, can you see my mouse, by the way? I'm not sure. Yes, we can see it. Okay, cool. So this delta term here, um, that contains downstream information of the network. So if you look, if you want to update this synapse here, right, it contains uh, information about XI, which is this neuron here, which is your, your input to that synapse. And that's fine because that information is locally available, but also contains this delta term. But hidden in this delta term is basically all this downstream information. So the question that we have to answer if we want to do a gradient descent in biological neural networks is how is that information transported back upstream to this neuron? Um, 
Now, I wanna take a brief detour into analog hardware because you can sort of think of the brain as an analog computer in some sense at least. Um, and I think it's very illuminating as to the challenges that you run into when you try to implement backpropagation in biological neural networks. So backprop has two computational pathways. There is the forward path and the backward path. In the forward path, you, you know, put your inputs into this network and these resistors here represent the synapses and information travels forward through here through your activation function. So this is one neuron's activation function. And notably this circuit here is open. So this is disconnected. So you're traveling forward through the network, you get your outputs and that's your inference. And then what you do is you, you apply your deltas, right? Your, your gradients at the output to the output of the network. And then information travels backwards. So you can go through these same uh, synapses in the backward pass and that's not a problem because this is just the transpose of the weights. But you end up passing through the derivative of the activation function. And the derivative of the activation function needs to be a separate circuit. And since you're taking two different paths, since through two different circuits, you're, you're, go you're going to have a problem with mismatch. So there's going to be inevitable mismatch between the activation function, a neuron's activation function, and its derivative. And so e that happens even for very simple circuits like ReLU, there's gonna be errors in the gradient estimate. And if you look at this, this uh, ReLU function here, I have four different neurons that implement ReLU. In, in analog, you'll see this type of behavior where even if you're trying to implement the same function with all of them, they'll all have slightly different characteristics. So your intercept will be different, your slopes will be different. And so that means that for each of these, the derivative, which is the step function, will, be, will have a different intercept and it'll have a different amplitude. And you're never going to be able to exactly match the forward activation function with the backwards uh, derivative. And that's gonna give you an error in the gradient and that error will compound through the layers of the neural network. And so if you try to implement backpropagation in a fully analog neural network, and many people have tried, um, it's, it's inevitably gonna fail. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that nobody has successfully been able to do it. You can, you can do it if you, if you sort of implement these in the digital domain, but then you're constantly converting between analog and digital, and that's not very easy to do from a hardware perspective. So now I wanna talk about an algorithm that has the potential to fix this problem. And this is equilibrium propagation. So equilibrium propagation is based on energy-based models, which satisfy a fixed point condition. And so this is very similar to the types of networks that Rafal mentioned, but basically the idea is that you fix your inputs to this neural network and you have a layered structure, just like a regular deep neural network. Um, but there are both sort of feed forward and feedback connections, but they're tied, they're symmetric connections. Right? And so this, this weight sort of here can be different from this weight, um, but the, the forward weight in this direction needs to be equal to the backwards weight in that direction. And that's sort of a limitation of this approach. But you clamp the input during the uh, inference phase called the free phase, and the network will settle to a minimum of the energy function that you have defined on the network. Now, once the network settles to the minimum of the energy function, you can look at the output of the network and you can compare it to your target. So this is a supervised uh, learning method, but you can also do unsupervised learning with it. Now, to get the gradient, the idea is that you slightly perturb the outputs and the network will settle to a new fixed point that's nearby to the original fixed point. And the gradient is computed by looking at the difference between the original fixed point, the free fixed point, and the perturbed fixed point. Uh, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, Arthur is saying we can see your cursor. Oh, you can't see my cursor. Oh, I apologize. I think Maybe I have to turn the pointer on. Is that, is that better? I can see it. Uh, Arthur, if you can't see, just let us know. Thanks, Jay. Cool, yeah. Um, so yeah, so the whole, uh, this, this whole scheme works on one kind of idea 
And that's that the fixed point condition lets you do something that I really think is kind of magical. It lets you replace total derivatives with partial derivatives. And I'll tell you what I mean here. So first of all, this is sort of an energy function. This is actually from a protein folding um, energy function. But these are the types of energy landscapes that these uh, deep hot field networks form. And this is, an, this is a typical energy function for these deep energy-based models. So this is kind of a modified hot field energy. Now, the important point is that if you want to get the gradient of your energy function, right, with respect to one of the weights, you're going to have two terms, right? You're going to have the direct influence of the weight on the energy, which is the, the partial derivative. And so if you look in this energy function here, uh, the energy function is a direct function of Wij, right? And so when you take the partial derivative, you'll get minus one half uh, rho ui times rho uj. And these are just the activations of the neurons. But you also have, a, have an effect where if you change one of the weights in the network, you'll also change the values of the activities of the neurons. And so I've lumped all of the, the neuron activities into this term S, which represents the state of the network. And so if you, if you perturb one of the weights, it's going to change the state of the network as well. And so you're going to get this term here. Now, this is a problematic term because this is obviously a non-local term. It basically says the entire network will change as a result of changing one synapse. But because of that fixed point condition, the condition that basically since you're at this energy minima, if you move in any direction with respect to the neurons activations, the derivative of the, of the energy is gonna be zero because it's a fixed point. So this partial derivative term is actually equal to zero and that kills this whole term. And so you have that the total derivative, the total effect of changing a weight on, in this network is equal to the partial derivative. The influence, the indirect influence via changing the state does not come into play. And that, in my opinion, is the heart of equilibrium propagation. It's what allows you to derive the actual update, and it's super important. Um, so yeah, now what we want to do is we want to apply these principles, basically using that, um, that fixed point condition that I just mentioned there, to a physical energy function. And so what we'll do is we'll construct a nonlinear analog resistor network. And we'll use what's called the pseudo power, the co-content of this resistor network as the energy function, because resistor networks, nonlinear resistor networks, naturally minimize this quantity. And so you can use it as an energy function because it's a fixed point. We can implement uh, nonlinearities with diode circuits. These are simple nonlinear resistors. Uh, and so we can very easily construct sigmoids or rectifiers similar to activation functions that we use in uh, neural networks. Now, the energy function is, as I mentioned, the pseudo power. And this is the pseudo power. And one thing that I just want to point out is it's, it's an integral um, of each independent element. So every diode, every resistor, every source here will have its own current voltage characteristic, right? which is this function here. And you integrate it from zero to the current that's flowing through that element, uh, you integrate the voltage. So in a linear case, if this is, for instance, a linear resistor, this is just the power dissipation. So it sort of is a nonlinear generalization of the power dissipation. And you just sum over all of the elements. So signal regeneration, because you're driving these high impedance devices, uh, you need the signal will decay naturally if you don't have any amplification. So what you can do is you can create, uh, you can use amplifiers to create a nonlinear active resistor. And this will, it'll basically be, it'll function just like a regular nonlinear resistor, except it will regenerate voltages as you pass through the network. So it prevents signal decay. And I wanna emphasize that the algorithm of equilibrium propagation that we describe works for arbitrary circuit topologies and not neuron nonlinearities. So the guts of the circuit does not matter. So it's completely independent of the actual implementation 
of the analog resistive circuit that you're looking at. Um, either way, the gradient will be will be the correct gradient. And because of this, it's independent of the inner working of the circuit. And how it does this is all of the computations, all the necessary computations are performed by the circuit itself. This really is using the physics of the circuit to perform all the computations that you need. And as a result, you only need to make measurements on the circuit. And so if you look at this update, this is, this is the gradient, right? Um, GIJ is the conductance of your, um, your resistor synapse. It only depends on the voltage drop across that synapse. And this is the voltage drop during the free phase. And this is the voltage drop during the weakly clamped phase. And this gives you the gradient. Beta is a scaling factor as well. So this gives you the gradient. So you can get the gradient just by basically running the circuit um, in two phases, a free phase and a perturbed phase, and making measurements on the circuit. Now, the main advantage of doing this is that it's extremely fast. So this, uh, these voltages will settle practically instantaneously to the minimum of the energy function on the order of tens of nanoseconds. And that's compared to tens or hundreds of microseconds or even milliseconds that, it requ that it's required to perform the iterative settling of conventional energy-based models. It's also extremely power efficient since it's um, fully analog. So now I want to connect this back to neuroscience. Um, since I know that's why everybody's here, it's what we're all interested in is how is the brain working? Is it doing gradient descent? How could it acquire the gradients? So we've talked so far about purely resistive circuits. So circuits with no explicit time varying elements. So capacitors, inductors, or memristors. But there, there is a framework that lets you describe time varying circuits as well in the same way that this energy minimization problem lets you describe circuits. So the idea is that we can merge this with the well-known conductance-based models of neuroscience, such as the Hodgkin-Huxley model. So the Hodgkin-Huxley model um, was a very important development in neuroscience. Hodgkin actually won the Nobel Prize for this, but it's basically a, it's a circuit model of a neuron that's capable of dynamically generating action potentials. So it is highly biologically plausible. Um, and it contains very simple elements, um, such as a capacitor here. So this is a capacitor. Uh, these are voltage sources, and this is the current source. This is a, a linear resistor. And then it contains several of these. And these initially were described as time-varying nonlinear resistors, but Leon Chu actually showed that these are, these are actually memristive systems. And so if we can create a circuit model of that um, Hodgkin-Huxley neuron in a way that's compatible with equilibrium propagation, then we can extract gradients for arbitrarily connected Hodgkin-Huxley neurons. And so the, the idea, and this is current work um, that I'm collaborating with Yashua Bengio on, the idea is to use a generalized version of Lagrangian mechanics which some people may be familiar with, uh, but it's basically a, um, it's another extreme extremization, like kind of fixed point type style of mechanics that allows you to describe time varying circuits and also asymmetrically connected circuits as well. Um, and it does this using a single scalar functional, which is a functional over trajectories that's analogous to the energy function. So if we can find a Lagrangian, for the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron circuit, we can use equilibrium propagation to compute the weight gradients in arbitrarily connected networks. And so this includes directed cyclic graphs with uh, asymmetric connections. And the, the gradient formula is exact, at least in the limit as the perturbation becomes small. So to, to conclude here, um, to summarize our, our previous work, we basically showed that um, 
Electrical circuits, analog resistive circuits, are a type of energy-based model. And you can train them using equilibrium propagation by using this concept of the pseudo power or, co or co content. The gradient estimate does not require any knowledge of the details of the circuit. It only uh, um, requires you to make measurements. And so it's robust to any kind of device variation and mismatch that you might have in that circuit, unlike backpropagation. One important point here too, is that we use only Kirchhoff's laws to prove these claims. So we only use the definition of the pseudo power as the energy function and Kirchhoff's laws. And we're able to prove this, uh, this gradient formula. And then our current work is to generalize these results from resistive circuits to time varying circuits with elements such as capacitors and memristors. And this has the potential to be able to solve the problem of gradient computation in biologically plausible models of neural circuits. And that's it for me. Um, we'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thanks a lot, Jack. That was awesome. Oh, I have a lot of questions. Uh, anyone who wants to start? Hi, Jeff. Or, um, um, yeah, what, what, you know, I'm not too familiar with kind of the, the circuit side of it from uh, mm -hmm. in terms of what's possible today, technically things. Do you have a sense for how fast this could run, um, Gail, compared to kind of more digital uh, solutions? Yeah, definitely. So we have performed some simulations with both uh, conventional uh, methods, so like PyTorch based methods, and circuit simulations of these networks. And we show about a 1000x um, speed up, not including IO. Um, so three to four orders of magnitude speed up on, on inference and backpropagation step. Well, that, that's that's nice. <laughs> uh, um, I have a question. So, Jack, in the paper you mentioned um, right at the end that due to hardware requirements, it was hard to run simulations with I think more than a hundred neurons at the time. Mm, you wrote. Yes. So, mm. did you make advances on that? I mean, were you able to train larger networks, larger data sets? Do you have more uh, like new updates on that that you would mm -hmm. like? It's a problem that's that we're currently working on. Um, so the issue actually has to do with, so we're using this um, circuit simulator that is a fairly high power circuit simulator called uh, Spectre. And the problem is that these circuit simulators are not built to do extremely large numbers of sequential simulations. They're built to do a handful of very complex time consuming simulations. And so the bottleneck is actually a communication barrier between the results of the circuit simulation and the parameters of the circuit and the update method that we're, that we're using. Basically, we have to shuttle back and forth information. And that turns out to be what's prohibitively slow. So we're working on a new framework that will allow us to get around this, um, this bottleneck. I see. And that, do you have a recommended circuit simulator tool? Someone is asking in the chat. Spectre is amazing, um, but it's extremely expensive. <laughs> um, NG Spice is it's fine. Okay. And it's free. OK. Um, Kevin, is, you had a question you want to ask? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, for some reason, the connection dropped out and everything dropped off of the Q&A, so I thought my question was gone. Um, yeah, so the question I have is, uh, what are the magnitudes of the capacitors in that uh, in that neural model? What, what are the RC time constants uh, that result from that? In the Hodgkin-Huxley model? Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I would estimate that they're if I had to put a number to it around one picofarad um, ish, but the time constant is on the order of on the order of one millisecond. Okay, so in your you're not restricted to those specific uh, 
scales in what you're trying to do. So in an implementation of what you're trying to do, uh, how do those, uh, what kind of magnitudes of capacitances are you looking at and how would you actually implement them? So if I were to build a, a network that does this, I would not implement the Hodgkin Huxley circuit. So the amazing thing about this framework is that it works for any electrical network. Um, it uses the, the fundamental physical principles of um, electrical circuit theory, plus this idea of equilibrium propagation, the exploiting the fixed point condition. Um, and in Lagrangian mechanics, you have an equivalent of the fixed point called the, um, the action, right? And so this action is extremized and that allows you to generalize this to time varying networks, directed time varying networks. Um, but if I were to implement this, I would use much faster circuits with uh, a much simpler architecture. I think that there, there might be benefit to having spikes um, because it's probably easier to, to propagate spikes in analog. And also one other interesting thing as well is that the functional form of spike time independent plasticity, uh, which is a, um, a weighted convolution with, a, with an STDP kernel, that kernel, it's an integral transform that falls out of this, of this framework as well. Um, so that's another reason why I think this is very interesting. So I was just kind of curious if, if you could just take advantage of parasitic capacitances and not actually have to implement a circuit element. So the parasitic capacitances are, are definitely a, um, a real thing. And we, we modeled these with, with realistic um, capacitances in terms of the, the inference time. Um, but you could, you could use those to, to your advantage if you, if you want to. And it would handle, that's a, another good thing about this is that it's, um, it's robust to any of those parasitic elements as well. Are we, uh, Thank you. Are we switching into a group discussion? Because I have a question for everybody, but I know I'm gonna jump ahead here. Uh, yeah, let, let's, let's move on to discussion time. Go on, Josh, please. Uh, so, um, well, first of all, I thought the three presentations were really great, both in content and the quality of the presentation. So thank you, I appreciate that much. Um, I have a meta question, uh, which I'm gonna turn into a meta, I mean, meta observation, which I'm gonna turn into a meta question, but I, and I invite any one of the uh, speakers to address it. Uh, you know, this is all about the biological plausibility of the current uh, methods that artificial neural networks use and how do we get, you know, how do we get on some of the bottlenecks in that. But there is, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole other aspect of why these networks are may, may not be biologically plausible. And that is, they, they actually capture a, very, a, a subset of what's actually going on in the brain. And it's very rare to talk about what's actually going on in the brain when we deal with vision. And, and I'll just take touch, as it's the simplest way to address this question. But sensory perception in brains is, is sensory motor. It's, it's, it's always sensory motor, in fact, every part of the neocortex every place you look, there are motor output neurons, even in V1 and V2, there are motor output neurons which move the eyes. In auditory, they move the head. Um, and of course, somatosensory or touch is a prime, it's a completely sensory motor system. You cannot infer something just by sorting in the hand, you have to move. And so um, I guess close, closer to what Cindy talked about, which I thought was very interesting because she talked about how it's sort of a pseudo movement, if you will, you're using temporal a proximity of spatial patterns to, to simulate a sensory movement. But I think one of the main problems here is that we see here is that, that it, it, we're not gonna really capture what's going on in the brain unless we deal with um, the whole idea of sensory motor perception and learning. Um, and that's just never talked, very rarely talked about. I mean, I, I, I can't say never because they're clearly, but, but the way it's done in brain is really, a, this is a major part of how brains work. Um, and I think it's fine that we don't have to do that in all of our artificial neural networks. Um, it's fine we can do these in all of too, but when we start talking about biological plausibility, I feel like that's the elephant in the room. It's like, well, we can't really do a biological plausibility until we deal with that issue. So I'm just curious how people feel about that. Um, that's my sort of meta question. It's just like, well, is, we have to worry about that now, or do you feel like, yeah, we can do it later, or do you stay awake at night thinking about this? I, I have a comment on that. Um, so this is where I think reinforcement learning comes in. So deep reinforcement learning specifically. When you go to deep reinforcement learning, um, you have to introduce a bunch of new machinery 
Um, and it's not obvious how you generalize regular deep learning to deep reinforcement learning. Um, and so I think the, the best example of this really is what DeepMind is doing um, with, with deep reinforcement learning. And I think you find that a lot of the machinery that you need to do deep reinforcement learning, and of course, backpropagation is central to it. They optimize with backpropagation. Um, but it's not backpropagation is not the whole story. But if you look at the machinery that's required in order to make backpropagation work in deep reinforcement learning, you find a lot of it has analogs in biological neural, neural networks. Um, so that's that's just my take on it. Yeah, that's, that is true. Uh, although it's, I, I I could get into arguments why it's, it's very uh, very insufficient compared to what I think neural frames do. I don't know if Cindy and Rafal uh, have similar comments or not. They don't want to put you on the spot if you don't want to. But... Yes, so, so I think this is a very interesting question uh, that action. So from the kind of predictive coding point of view, um, I, I think I need to kind of quote a person who did a lot of work on predictive coding um, in the neuroscience uh, world, uh, who is Carl Friston. And he proposed this really interesting extension of predictive coding to domain of action. So in predictive coding, uh, the idea is that you uh, have predictions and you have these prediction errors. So constantly try to minimize the prediction errors. Uh, and in predictive coding, you do this by learning. So you update your um, expectation to match the reality. But Calprop to minimize prediction errors. Uh, so the first is to, um, if you have prediction error, you basically learn. So you update your um, uh, expectation to match the stimuli. But there's a second way is to update the world to match your expectation, which is action. And this sounds very strange. Why would you uh, like to update the world to match your expectation? But what Carl said is that there are some expectations which really um, brain should always maintain. So for example, you have an expectation that your food resources should be on certain level. And if these expectations are not met, then uh, the brain is essentially trying to minimize prediction errors between your uh, true fault reserves and the ones which you expect, and then essentially infers actions to uh, drive this. So uh, from his point of view, both perception and action are driven by exactly the same mechanism, which is minimization of the energy function, uh, which in predictive coding case is this sum of errors across all different levels. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to kind of um, also say that um, I'm, interested in this, um, also in this part of the brain, um, which is uh, supporting reinforcement learning, where um, there are neurons and coding prediction errors, uh, uh, which are known as dopaminergic neurons. But these dopaminergic neurons are not only important for learning, but they are also important for action planning. Um, and when you have part, when if someone gets Parkinson's disease, which is caused by death of dopaminergic neurons, you have some deficiency in learning, but you really have problems with planning, which suggests that these errors are really minimization of errors, are really involved in um, basically both learning and action planning. And I, I recently um, published a paper in, uh, in a journal called eLife, uh, which proposes a predictive coding model which describes both how, how learning and um, planning is described in a kind of single predictive coding network, which tries to minimize prediction errors. Yeah, maybe I can add a, a third perspective to the question. Um, so I think uh, Rafael already like touched onto it, but I think there is like a, an important distinction to make whether you want to use actions because you're interested in like making actions in your environment, which is kind of the deep reinforcement learning kind of view, or whether you want to take actions such that you can learn about your environment more efficiently. And I think for the, the second area, um, kind of taking the causal perspective is very important because their only actions can en enable you to test your causal hypotheses, which can give you more insight about the environment that you're um, in. That's a fantastic point. Yeah, I have a question and it relates to one of the questions in the Q&A as well. So I think someone uh, asked, I think this is for you, Rafael, uh, that predictive coding seems to need these extra error neurons. Do we have evidence that these exist in biological systems? And my sort of more general question related to that is, you know, there's a, when you look at inhibitory neurons in the neocortex, there's a huge diversity of them. It's, they're not 
just one type of inhibitory neuron. There's the, you know, a lot of different, uh, you know, response profiles and plasticity rules, and and the the, the structure of them are quite different. Um, how do how do you think about that in the context of your theory? Do you have a do you have an explanation for that? And, and is there, you know, how, what is the evidence for these error neurons and so on? Yes, so uh, that's, a, that's a very important question. So there is, I think, very strong evidence um, for error neurons in the subcortical systems, in particular in the basal ganglia. I mentioned already these dopaminergic neurons, which are well known to encode the reward prediction errors, but also other types of errors not, um, as well. And um, as I mentioned, I was recently working on trying to map try to model this kind of subcortical networks with predictive coding networks. And the advantage of looking at the subcortical regions is that they are actually much simpler. There's many, there are multiple types of uh, inhibitory neurons, but maybe not as many as in cortex. And we know exactly how they are connected and how this whole system um, you know, uh, operates. We understand them by biology much to much larger extent than we understand the cortex. But of course, the holy grail is to, is, is to understand the cortex. And in cortex, there is um, smaller evidence for this error neurons, but there is generally known that there are neurons which respond to unexpected events, to novel situations, and so on. Um, and um, I think that there was one particularly nice stu uh, study which was looking explicitly for error neurons in the cortex, which is a study by Attinger et al. from 2017 in a journal called Cell. Um, in which they essentially uh, created a virtual reality for mice and they um, um, recorded the um, activity in the visual cortex. And essentially at some points they were um, breaking the uh, feedback between the movement of the animal and the visuals, visual image. And they noticed that there were particular neurons which actually responded during this mismatch be between the kind of hot top level expectation, which comes from movement and the actual visual system, visual input. And they identified the whole network where these neurons are located and uh, in which layers of the cortex and try to identify their connectivity. And I, I think these studies are super important because they get us closer to, um, to the mapping. And, I, I, and um, you know, so, so my uh, goal before retirement is to be able to map the predictive coding uh, architecture on the six layers of the neural cortex. Of course, uh, if you of course believe that predictive coding is the right model, but maybe some kind of, rather than predictive coding, some other energy-based model um, and with mod modular errors um, as Cindy proposed. So, 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 so there's like many, many of these kind of elements are probably incorporated uh, in, in, the, uh, in the brain circuits. Um, but you know, we, I, I think that we are not, I'm not sure if we're in the point or already where we can try to do this mapping. Maybe the theory of these energy-based models have to be better understood. Maybe you have to kind of extend them to the temporal domain with which Jack mentioned. And maybe, um, you know, we really try to understand what are the essential elements which these models actually need to be able to start mapping them on the cortex. I just want to point out that just, just for the record, I mean, Nementa and our team has the same goals, although we don't try to predict, uh, map on energy-based models per se. We, we are trying to understand a much more complex sensory motor interaction that occurs in the cortex. And um, it involves movement and planning and attention <laughs> and temporary memory and all that stuff. So uh, I think it's a good worthy goal. I'm to encourage you to think broader than uh, perhaps energy functions. <laughs> As the, there is a second part of that question that I also think, think it, it's interesting. Uh, is it reasonable to expect uh, biological systems to relax to equilibrium? That's, I think that's a key premise no. in the method, right? No, it's not. <laughs> I don't think it is, uh, personally. So that's why I think the Lagrangian framework is, is necessary, because that does not require you to settle to an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe we lost profile. Oh, did we? Okay. Uh, no. Uh, hmm. Hopefully, you'll be able to join in. We have a lot of questions in the Q and A. Uh, looks like we have a few people with hands up too. So I don't know how you want to deal with that, Lucas. So. Oh, we do. Um, yeah, let me invite them, and then maybe they can ask the questions. One, one comment for for Jeff. Um, I think that so Jeff. Uh, I think you are super interested in the 
architectural implementation of Cortex and how sort of architecturally it works. Um, and I think of that separately from the sort of optimization algorithm. And so I think the reason that deep learning is successful is because it works for arbitrary architectures. And I, I think it would be awesome if you could take your architecture and find a way to efficiently compute gradients and optimize it that way. That I think would be. I think that's uh, it's sort of like, uh, you know, which, which direction you're coming from. Um, and uh, I, the problem, as I said already, I'll just repeat it again, the cortical function is, is far more complex than what most neural network researchers think today. And um, I mean, getting back to what others had said, you know, we learn through movement. We, we don't learn by looking at images. We learn by attending to different components as we move our hands and move objects and walk through the world. It's the only way you can learn the world. And so I think the problem is, you know, we want to do is make sure that we incorporate, think about as many of these uh, sort of uh, cognitive and uh, high level constraints about what it means to learn as a, as a being, what the cortex does. Um, and because if you, and, and start with that is like, we have to explain all this stuff. <laughs> and if I just focus on one part of it, I'm just not gonna get the answer. That's my belief. Um, so, uh, and yeah, on the whole gradient descent thing, I, and I'm not a believer in it. I thought it was very interesting some of the different proposals to the Hagen around that. Uh, but you know, alternate to this is really a sensory motor learning system. And that's an alternate to all the gradient descent problems or all the sort of uh, optimization, global optimization problems. It's another way of solving them. That's what our papers are about. Um, so I, I, it just, this is the constant, you know, as a biologist or a neuroscientist, I say, hey, you guys, all this complexity is there and it's really meaningful and it exists everywhere in the cortex. And it's so much more complex than most people realize. Uh, and yet, so I want to be biased in that direction. All because oh, we got these really efficient algorithms. They work really well at certain problems, image labeling or whatever. Um, so why don't we just look at how the biology does that? And I'm like, well, yeah, we have to do that, but it's a subset with a, it's a small subset. So it's just a disagreement perhaps about it. Um, uh, just different perspectives coming at the same problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think one area where that might uh, be highlighted also is, you know, something, if you think about continual learning, um, you know, that seems to be a little bit at odds with a kind of a batch IID framework and, you know, gradient descent and thinking of it that way. Uh, we do have a question, I think, for Cindy uh, along these lines, like greedy Infomax. Have you thought about catastrophic forgetting? And uh, does it, is it, can you say anything about uh, continual learning and catastrophic forgetting in, in, in your setting? Um, I, I know you talked about asynchronous learning, but that's, uh -huh. a, that's slightly different. I've never thought about that, that aspect, to be honest. Um, so one kind of intuition I have is that potentially because the modules get trained individually, they should be more robust to changes to their inputs because they encounter them throughout training while not being able to influence it by themselves. Um, but I'm not sure whether that would actually translate to catastrophic forgetting. Although, well, you could maybe kind of get around it by only training, retraining certain modules and not mm -hmm. others. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I haven't explored that direction at all. I guess related to that, have you thought about, um, I mean, the way you're learning each layer, you know, it doesn't, the layers don't know anything about the task or their supervision, mm -hmm. supervision signal by definition. So it, it seems like the representations these networks learn could be particularly good for transfer learning and for learning, um, you know, completely new categories and new situations that just work on the same input domain. Have you looked at that at all? Uh, uh, not with, within Greedy Infomax, but there's actually a, a bunch of contrastive learning papers that um, started to explore that direction. Um, hmm. So they, they might not use the influencer E objective itself, but like other contrastive methods. And that seems to work really well, actually, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and if I can uh, piggyback on that question, uh, I know someone asked and you already answered in the chat, but what is your future plans uh, regarding Grid Infomax? Like what research direction are you taking now? Um, yeah, um, I'm actually like at the moment kind of in the in-between between projects. So um, I still have to decide that, but like there's, I think a lot of potential directions that um, are very exciting. So either just um, look for more benefits that this local learning might bring. Like for example, the robustness that I just mentioned, I could imagine that this local learning makes layers more robust because they have to handle different inputs throughout their training. Um, 
or kind of test the hypothesis that I was talking about before, why this local learning actually works, whether it's the mutual information optimization or this clustering in the latent space or anything else, um, or also just like develop more loss functions or find more, more loss functions that work on this local learning. So we're not restricted to just only using the inference CE loss. Mm -hmm. and you, uh, what sort of loss functions are you thinking about? Yeah, they mean. Well, I guess that depends on the, the second point on like what are the actual like things that make it work. So if it's actually the clustering hypothesis, can we like use other clustering losses um, to do local learning? I see. Uh, there were uh, some people raised their hands. I added them as panelists. So if you want to ask a question, I just go ahead. Akeem, JD, and Gonzalo, just feel free. Okay. Otherwise, we can uh, pick up some questions from the Q and A. Uh, I think this this is a very easy question, and uh, that's for Rafal. So, in the predictive coding network, are weights between the error nodes and and signal node Zx also subject to modification, or are they static? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, in the original predictive coding, they are static and they are equal to one, while um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are this other generalization of predictive coding uh, developed by Baron Millage. So you can essentially replace this one-to-one -one connections with this one-to-one -one static weights by all-to-all -all connections with um, essentially um, weights which are plastic. So you can modify the model. So in the original model, they are fixed to one, but you can uh, generalize the model. This has been done by Baron Millage and his colleagues when they are um, plastic. Okay. Now we, we ask a question. I we, we you drop right when we ask, and I, I'm interested to know your answer. So, is it reasonable to expect uh, the neurons to relax in equilibrium state? And Jack already <laughs> gave his answer that it is not. But I mean, interesting your perspective. Yeah. So this is a very interesting question. Um, which, uh, yeah, so it's probably not, uh, prob you, you could imagine that this may happen in situations where you have a static input. That, but th this, ha ha this happens very rarely in the real world. Like you, usually um, the, the brain is trying to predict change um, dynamic stimuli. And in this case, there is no equilibrium because the stimulus is constantly changing. So, so, so yeah, so it would be uh, very interesting to, uh, generalize uh, values, energy models, and um, values ap uh, approximation of backpropagation, including predictive coding to this framework. So yes, I agree. This is unrealistic assumption. It would be really interesting to kind of generalize these models, and I, I think it's possible to generalize them. Okay, thanks. Um, looking for other questions here. So one of the top ones is for you, Cindy. And um, I think you answered in the talk, but maybe we can go over it again. So how are the local losses uh, defined in InfoMax? If they are based on prediction error? Uh, yeah, the, the um, top that maybe clarification. Yeah, I can um, try to give it an intuitive overview. So the idea is that you have like the positive sample of the um, the two patches that are temporally nearby that should be belonging together. And then you have a, a bunch of negative samples, which are just randomly paired. Um, and essentially you're using a cross entropy loss uh, such that the model has to learn to classify the positive sample correctly as being the positive sample. And that is applied on all layers as the local loss. You, you talked a little bit about kind of the, the scaling benefits of um, the technique, but uh, have you looked at convergence rates compared to standard backprop? Does it converge as fast or does it need uh, more iterations? Uh, it's roughly the same as the end-to-end okay. um, -end contrastive learning, yeah. Hmm. So, so I had a question. You, you converted a spatial problem with that cat to a temporal one. Uh, is there any reason why you just didn't stay in the spatial domain? Um, actually, like the ex experiments were very heavily inspired by CPC, which is like the, the method that uh, so, um, proposed this loss function that we're using. Um, and since we only wanted to show that we can use this without end-to-end -end backpropagation, we just kind of took the experiments that they did and then used it in our local learning. Mm 
set up. Wasn't that the whole premise of how the whole thing worked? That, that you serialized it in some sense? Does that make sense? That you? I mean, like you took, that you had to treat those sequentially in time as your training signal. Mm -hmm. well, you could, yeah, that's, that's I mean, that, was, that, was the, that was inherent. It was in the inherent to the way her solution worked. I don't know how you could do I it. Guess, yeah. I guess <laughs> I kind of the, the inspiration for this loss is that like you want to learn these slow features. So as an example, what I was saying, like the speaker identities that is shared across time. Um, uh, and then, yeah, to apply to images, it's more like going from the time domain on the spatial domain and then enforcing some kind of order there. Could this also be applied to with something like MoCo, uh, momentum contrast? Because um, that's also a slow feature learner, but it doesn't require this temporal structure. Mm -hmm. So recently there was actually a paper that tried the same with the Sinclair objective, uh, which um, essentially applies random transformation on an image and then um, the positive sample is the same image with two different random transformations and it has to learn uh, that these two, belong, two belong together. Uh, and that paper actually uh, showed that that one, that loss doesn't work so well in the local learning domain. Um, and I think uh, intuitively it also makes sense that it doesn't work so well because you simply don't have features on the first layer that would be able to tell whether one image is the same as the other one if you've applied random transformations to it. So you're basically, basically leaving a top the lowest layer that is going to be very hard or impossible for that layer to solve. And that's already kind of setting you off to a bad start. Um. I, I have a question I was waiting for the end, but I can ask now. Um, so do you think with, with the new attention models and the success we have, have been seeing of the attention models using backpropagation, do you, do you think these alternatives that we are discussing today, they are going to replace backpropagation in the following years or there is still going to be an alternative and backpropagation is going to remain as the main a training paradigm, and that's for all the speakers. I think uh, I think backprop will remain around uh, the the main workhorse for another couple of years, um, but I think eventually we're going to find a more causal compatible version of that, um, like Cindy mentioned a little bit. So I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. I do think that backprop is, is hard to beat because of its efficiency. Um, and I think that hardware is actually gonna play a large part in determining that. Yeah, but I'd argue, you know, backprop also has some fundamental problems like really being, I think, again, going back to continual learning, that's sort of just completely against the very nature of batch gradient based <laughs> methods. Um, and so, you know, there are ways of, uh, there, there's a lot of research I'm trying to, uh, you know, use backprop to, uh, you know, solve continual learning in different ways, but it, that may be an area where you really need to rethink the objectives and, and, and how learn, what learning, what is the purpose of learning in some sense. I would also argue that um, I don't, I don't think Backprop is the be all and end all. I, mean, I don't particularly like backprop, but I think that the idea of gradient descent is fundamental. Um, and it's because of the structure of the loss surfaces of deep neural networks. If you look at the loss surface of a deep neural network, it interacts with gradient descent in a highly unexpected way in very non-trivially. And if you look at other biological systems, such as protein folding, they have the same structure in their energy landscape. And I think it's a really fundamental physical principle that the brain also uses. Um, and I think that's the best evidence that something like gradient descent, and I think even second order methods. So second order methods have the benefit of much faster convergence and better data efficiency than first order. Um, but I think that that's going to stick around, my, my, my opinion. One thing I like about uh, 
Cindy's presentation was the fact that uh, it's well known in hardware that communication delay is more important than computational delay. And the fact that it can be dealt with locally with uh, local communications and smaller memories, I think is a, is a good plus for that because data centers are hurting uh, incredibly with communication uh, burn on power and stuff. I would caution um, that we separate where AI and artificial neural networks are today and how they will be dressing for the next several years and where it's ultimately going to end up. And I actually think they're different places. And so, um, you know, we've made the argument that uh, Cortex basically works by building models of things using sensory motor interaction and the models are based on reference frames. And so none of that's in today's networks. Um, but you know, our bet is that's that's where it's going to ultimately end up. The question is, are these two worlds? Do they merge? Um, how far do you go before the second one comes in? Is our opinion. Um, so I think there are other fundamental ways of, of biological systems learning that are completely different than today's uh, ways of thinking about it. And um, and and I think those are going to win in the end. But you know, at the end, four years from now or forty years from now, I think it's an interesting question. There's a nice question that relates to some of our past uh, meetings here for Jack and Jeff. In biological neurons, there are complex dendritic tree structures. Do you think we will need any special machinery for learning in these neurons as compared with simple uh, linear neuron models? So I don't know if uh, Jack or Raphael or Cindy, if you guys have uh, thoughts on that. I know we, we've published and talked about this quite a bit. But I mean, I have, a, I have a comment on that. And this is one of the main pluses of this physical way of viewing uh, neural networks from just starting with the physics um, is that equilibrium propagation doesn't, it doesn't care about the, the circuits at all. It's completely independent of, of the circuits. And so you can have as complex a dendritic structure as you want uh, and you will still be able to get the, the gradients efficiently. So I think that I personally believe that that's what's actually happening um, is that the, again, the learning and the architecture are decoupled. And you need a learning algorithm that's able to work with any arbitrary underlying circuit and different architectures will have different results. So maybe if you implement dendritic branches that gives you some benefit from the architecture wise, but you're still gonna, you're still able to compute gradients efficiently. But that's the assumption that computing gradients is, is the thing you want to do. If, yeah, absolutely. That, that's not the but assumption that it's going to be effective. Um, and that's, again, that's it, my yeah, personal opinion. In today's, today's problems, uh, but, you know, anyway, so I don't know if Cindy or Rafael have a thought on that. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about dendrites, dendritic trees to. Um, <laughs> say something helpful, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I still wanted to get your input on the, whether you think bad propagation will be around for a few years or when, when will these alternatives be ready to replace pro pro bad propagation? And if they're gonna be ready and, or bad propagation will always be there and these are our alternatives we're discussing. Um, well, I would definitely expect it to be there around for quite a couple of years still, um, just because I, I think it is still a quite unquestioned method in AI. I mean, now we have this discussion around here, but like if I tell people what I'm working on, like they sometimes get quite shocked that I like dare to question backpropagation. So I think as long as this belief is around, we're gonna also be working with it for quite a while uh, still. But at the same time, we're also facing like a lot of problems in AI that like, for example, that we can't generalize to unseen data and things like that, which I believe in the end could also be connected to back propagation. Um, so if we can overcome those with other methods, um, that could be a potential for a paradigm shift maybe. I mean, your, your results are really compelling so far. What areas do you see where back propagation is still significantly better than what the greedy informatics paradigm. Are there clear areas that you, you, you that you still need to tackle? 
Um, well, Greedy Infomax so far only works with this one specific loss function. So if you're interested in just doing classification, probably doing it with backpropagation is still going to help you more um, mm -hmm. just because uh, mathematically it's going to give you the right solution. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but within classification, is there anything, you know, is there any big advantage to backprop that you see? still over over what you well, if you have a large data set with labels then probably backpropagation is pretty unbeatable because hmm. it's just going to optimize your entire network to do well on that data set but then if you're interested in generalizing to new images or using non-iid data um, then i think backpropagation currently is more or less the only thing that we have but i can see how there could be alternatives doing better on that Yes, and I agree. And, uh, you know, there are some domains where brain is still superior over backpropagation, like uh, um, problems where there's a limited amount of data, small networks, uh, maybe some concept drift, continual learnings. And maybe for these domains, some new algorithms will be uh, developed. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, we are getting actually <laughs> went past time about 12 minutes uh if anyone wants to add any closing remarks the speakers or panelists i had um <clears throat> one notion is that uh we're looking at an either or for back propagation and say something like uh, uh greedy infomax uh it would seem like if you were running them at two different time scales you could get benefits of both, where the greedy infomax is the continuous one, kind of trying to keep things going, but every once in a while it gets a validation step from back propagation coming through. So you kind of get best of both worlds with a hybrid approach, maybe. I think that alludes to a comment someone had in the Q and A as well. If you can uh, combine energy-based models or even back propagation with uh, greedy infomax. And I think the answer is yes, you can, right? Or maybe <laughs> you can. But, uh, yeah, I think it's possible for sure. But yeah, but, but you know, is it is it worth it? Is it is it going to buy you anything? I guess that's the question. Yeah, I guess my okay. my opinion is that we're gonna. If you look at second order methods, they're actually much better than gradient descent in a lot of ways. But there's just no efficient implementations of them. They're too hardware inefficient, but there are hints. Um, and if you go back to electrical circuit theory that you can actually do the matrix inversions that are necessary um, for that very efficiently. So I think that, I think that the, the next step is actually second order methods sort of pass backprop um, and that we'll see new hardware that's more efficient and in implementing those or maybe new algorithms. Um, my sort of closing remark, I guess. All right, anyone else? Take one, two, three. <laughs> All right, so thanks a lot for coming. It was awesome. I really, really enjoyed. Uh, the video is gonna be available on YouTube. There are a few questions left. I'm gonna add to a Google Docs and send you the link. So if you can please uh, answer that, that would be awesome. And I also add the questions you already answered to the chat. And um, hope to see you soon, maybe probably in the Rips or some other conference. Awesome. Yeah, I just, just want to underscore all three of you. The, the presentations were really fantastic and thought provoking. And, and uh, for those come, you know, from Europe and, and the UK, thank you for doing this in the evening, your time. <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll, second, I'll second that too. Really excellent presentation. So thank you all for that. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I think yeah, this would be a great video for others to look back on and, and watch as well later. So thank you. Awesome. There to go beyond back. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this, this video will be around even long after backdrop's gone. <laughs> and I look forward to it. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I look forward to your uh, workshops in the Oh yeah, yeah like that, that's a hope you'll all be there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right.
Take care, everyone. Amazing. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.